All right, good morning. I'd like to, uh, like to thank the Kidney Cancer Association for inviting me to talk. Uh, we're gonna switch uh, gears completely. Uh, uh, Brian was talking about uh, small localized, and we're gonna talk about the uh, patients that have locally advanced renal cell cancer. I'd also like to, to take a moment to sincerely thank our patients. Uh, you provide us so much inspiration and, and show us how to improve. Uh, and I just wanted to you know, take a moment to thank you for that. So we'll, we'll talk today about patients with tumor thrombus, uh, patients with lymph node involvement of their kidney cancer, and then invasion of adjacent organs. Uh, when we talk about venous invasion or tumor thrombus, uh, it occurs in about 10% of patients with kidney cancer. It makes surgery more complex, uh, and the thrombus may be confined to just the renal vein or it can actually travel all the way up and be into the right heart, which obviously increases the complexity of surgery. And you can see that the thrombi can, uh, can be either free-floating, so something you can pull right out, or they can actually be attached to the entire uh, large uh, vein going back to the heart. Patients present with different symptoms, uh, swelling in their legs, uh, blood clots in their lungs, sometimes just protein in their, in their urine. Sometimes patients are completely asymptomatic. This is, this is a patient uh, who has a thrombus uh, you can see that it extends up uh, actually into the heart. And the only symptom he had was some dilated veins on his scrotum. So when we look at surgery uh, for patients that, that had venous thrombus, uh, some of these were done in the early 20th century. Uh, it's really impressive to think that anesthesia was really at its infancy at that time. And they were doing these surgeries in some cases successfully. Uh, the rationale at that time was that in non-metastatic patients, if you could remove all of the tumor, about half of those patients would be cured with surgery alone. And then surgery also provided a palliative benefit and local control uh, to prevent the, the thrombus from extending up higher. These are, these are still true today. So it's really important when we evaluate patients before surgery that we have a multidisciplinary approach. We in, uh, invite the anesthesia team, uh, medical oncologists, sometimes vascular surgery, cardiothoracic surgery, uh, liver surgeons, or transplant surgeons, and that we get a really uh, uh, comprehensive workup uh, before we do these surgeries. High quality imaging is critical for planning surgery. Depending where you're at, this might be an MRI or a CT scan. And then we also intraoperatively will use a, a transesophageal uh, echocardiogram to monitor uh, during surgery. This is a, a case um, and I've changed the names, but these are all real cases. Uh, Mark is a 54-year-old gentleman who, had, who presented with lower extremity swelling. Uh, he has a, a tumor in his left kidney, you can see. Uh, and then he has thrombus throughout his uh, inferior vena cava and actually extending into both of his legs. This is an MRI image that also shows that his left renal vein with the thrombus went behind the aorta, which increases the complexity uh, even further. This is a, uh, this is a, four, a 4D MRI, uh, and I'll have to, to uh, acknowledge and thank our medical physics department and our radiologists uh, for developing a lot of these techniques. Uh, but it can show the blood flow uh, around these uh, uh, thrombi uh, and into the arterial uh, portions as well. And you can see here, this is actually tracking the individual uh, particles through the, uh, through the vessels. You can see the, the absence of blood flow. Let's see. Can you play that one more time? Nope. That's all right. It's always a problem when you try to put a video into a, into a talk. Uh, what we're showing, and you, you can just leave it on this, you can show the arterial blood flow, and this guy actually did have a duplicated renal artery. Uh, the area that's highlighted in green was the inferior vena cava that we actually completely removed and then put a graft of uh, a bovine pericardial graft uh, that's, that's going back up to his inferior vena cava, connecting it uh, to the rest of his uh, circulation, and we removed out all that area of uh, his uh, tumor. Uh, 
uh, and he's doing well about six months after, after surgery. But it really highlights the advantages of, of having these uh, techniques preoperatively. It's also really important uh, to uh, look during surgery to monitor these patients uh, closely, to look for an increase in the thrombus height, uh, to evaluate the fluid management, and to look for uh, tumor embolization when you have blood pressure shifts. This is a patient we operated on last week. Uh, she had a level two IVC thrombus. Uh, you can see that she's developed extensive collateral circulation. Uh, the blood is shunted to other areas because it's no longer able to get back to the, to the heart through the inferior vena cava. And this is her intraoperative monitoring. You can see that little area in, within the IVC around those uh, red dots there is the thrombus. And then this is after we compressed and put clamps across that to remove it. Uh, and th this is you know, something that's invaluable to us uh, when we can look at the patient's blood pressure and correlate it with the findings on the, old, on the uh, TE. So there's a lot of different uh, classification systems for how high the tumor thrombus goes. Most commonly, we use the uh, Nevis system. For patients with level one or level two thrombus, uh, we basically place clamps on all the inflows and all the outflows, then make an incision in the inferior vena cava and pull it out. Sometimes we have to resect an area. Uh, sometimes we have to graft an area if we've removed too much of the IVC. As the thrombus uh, heights get higher, if the, the tumor goes above the uh, hepatic blood supply. Uh, at this point, sometimes you, you really need a multidisciplinary approach uh, to occlude the hepatic blood supply for a few minutes. And as the uh, tumors get higher and even approach into the right heart, uh, this is really a time sometimes you have to have the cardiothoracic surgeon come in. You can either do a sternotomy or you can come from below and pull this out of the heart. But this definitely increases the risk of bleeding, uh, stroke, and cardiac dysfunction afterwards. So we'll just kind of re review some of the more contemporary data for uh, renal cell cancer with thrombus. Uh, what's the best strategy to look at vein margins? We all know we want to remove the entire, uh, you know, the entire area of cancer. And if there's any margins in, in the vein walls, uh, how, how much of a problem is that? As surgeons, we macroscopically always remove that. Uh, but how important are the uh, microscopic vein margins? So this is a, a, a project uh, I did when I was a fellow uh, with uh, Dr. Wood, uh, but looking at the microscopic invasions uh, of, uh, of margins that where we were resected. And what we found uh, was that, in general, uh, margins, we always try to avoid them, but margins are, are less uh, a marker of uh, where the, the tumor is going to recur in an isolated fashion and more a marker of uh, aggressive disease. So what's the best strategy? We should remove all uh, macroscopic tumor, uh, and it's definitely prognostic for aggressive tumors. Uh, occasionally, we, we will do frozen sections of the, of the wall, so we'll uh, look pathologically intraoperatively, uh, but more often, we'll do a wide uh, excision with a reconstruction replacement as necessary. This is a study out of the Mayo Clinic, again, looking at some radiographic uh, factors, uh, looking at uh, right-sided tumors, the diameter of the, the uh, area where the renal vein enters the inferior vena cava, and then complete occlusion. Uh, and they found that if you had uh, two or more of these predictors, or sorry, all three of these predictors, then your, your risk of uh, needing reconstruction was much higher. So this helps us uh, plan for surgery. So what about patients that present with pulmonary emboli? Uh, we think this is about 5% of all patients. Uh, and traditionally, these, these patients are thought to have worse outcomes. And our, new, our anesthesiologist will tell us that these patients have a very high surgical risk, uh, and they quote that from non-renal cell cancer patients. But are these patients really at, at a higher risk? And so we looked into this, uh, and this is a collaborative effort between the University of Wisconsin, UT Southwestern, and MD Anderson, and we looked at 782 patients, and about 4% of those patients had a PE prior to their diagnosis uh, and prior to surgery. So we found no difference in their 90-day mortality in the patients who presented with a PE, uh, and no difference in the cancer-specific outcomes or the recurrence rates. Uh, so this is important because these patients uh, should be offered uh, surgery uh, if it can benefit them. And again, this is showing uh, over time about 63% of these patients who did not have metastatic disease did not have recurrence after surgery. <laughs> 
So what about using pre-surgical uh, targeted therapy? This had been a uh, thing that was uh, you know, very, uh, very talked about and there were a lot of different case reports. Many publications uh, talking about shrinking the tumor uh, using targeted agents. But we really need to consider how often does it respond? Uh, does it shrink enough to change the surgical approach? Are patients able to tolerate the adverse effects of systemic therapy? And is the risk of deferring surgery outweighed by the risk of the thrombus extension causing hepatic or cardiac dysfunction? So several studies have um, looked at this. They're not large studies, uh, but uh, kind of multi-institutional studies, and showed that few of the thrombi actually decreased enough to change the surgical approach. And so the majority of patients should not get neoadjuvant chemotherapy to shrink the thrombus specifically. Uh, there are certainly some patients uh, that benefit from neoadjuvant therapy, uh, and the theoretical benefits are, are greatest in the patients with the highest level thrombus, because uh, potentially these patients could avoid uh, cardiac uh, bypass. So what about patients with the highest level IVC thrombus? This is less than 1% of all patients with uh, renal cell cancer. It's really the thrombus that extends above the hepatic circulation and sometimes into the heart. What are the risks? There's really a lack of high quality data. This is a, uh, a chart that just kind of shows the, uh, the studies that had looked at this uh, prior to uh, uh, 2012. Uh, and if you look, these are all large uh, time periods, meaning that patients that got operated on in 1970s were very different than the patients that got operated on in the 2000s. They're all small studies. Uh, and they have very different definitions of how mortality is defined. And these are, these are data, these are things that people want to discuss prior to surgery. Uh, so again, we uh, collaborated with uh, four institutions, the Mayo Clinic, MD Anderson, Southwestern, and uh, University of Wisconsin. We looked at 162 patients and their outcomes from 2000 to 2012. Uh, and then we classified the complications and the mortality within 90 days. So we found about a third of these patients had major complications uh, within 90 days. Independent preoperative predictors of that were the highest level thrombus as well as systemic symptoms. There was no difference in the complication, uh, no difference in the complication rates for or perioperative mortality for patients who had cardiopulmonary bypass. It it looks like that that was not as as much an important factor as the patients themselves. And so when we found about a 10% mortality in about 90 days, uh, which is something that I think people want to discuss prior to surgery. This is potentially a life-saving surgery, but it's also a very you know, somewhat risky surgery in, in, in hospitals in, in the, the modern era. This is our proposed management. Uh, it hasn't changed very much. Uh, if you have metastatic disease, uh, we uh, recommend a multidisciplinary co uh, consultation. And really, surgery at an experienced center is, is key for this type of surgery. So just for, for a couple minutes, I wanted to talk about cytoreductive nephrectomy for patients who have uh, tumor thrombus. This is, again, a multidisciplinary, uh, I'm sorry, multi-institutional uh, series of 427 patients uh, treated at uh, several different centers. Uh, we looked at the thrombus level as, all, as well as risk models uh, that were calculated preoperatively. Uh, and looked at overall survival in these patients. So for the pa only for the patients who had IVC thrombus above the diaphragm were, was the uh, survival statistically worse. So patients with IVC thrombus below the diaphragm or patients with renal vein only thrombus uh, did better than the patients with the thrombus above the diaphragm. We looked at the, uh, the, the Mozart criteria, the MSKCC criteria, which were prognostic, as were the IMDC criteria. Uh, as were the uh, criteria developed at MD Anderson uh, by Steve Culp uh, in the cancer uh, paper in 2010. So these were all predictive of whether or not patients uh, did well after surgery. But we found uh, the one striking thing is patients most likely to have an early mortality, meaning less than nine months following cytoreductive nephrectomy, uh, were patients with sarcomatoid features or patients with the highest level IVC thrombus. It's also important to note, uh, this is the, the series of patients where it says current series, that these patients had as good survival or better than some of the population-based series of cytoreductive nephrectomy. So just because you have a tumor thrombus does not mean that your survival is gonna be any less than someone else with a cytoreductive nephrectomy. In fact, it looks like it's slightly better in some of these risk categories. <laughs> 
So the conclusions about uh, IVC thrombus patients uh, it definitely increases the complexity of surgery and the risk that there's going to be complications afterwards. Uh, it may provide a durable cure, so there's definitely a rationale to do the surgery in patients, uh, especially non-metastatic patients. Uh, upfront surgery is really the standard of care with patients uh, who have venous thrombus. Many patients who present with a PE uh, do just as well as the patients that uh, do not present with a PE. And we really have to consider individual patient and tumor characteristics for cytoreductive nephrectomy. So what about uh, renal cell cancer involving the lymph nodes? So this is uh, data from Dr. Uh, Blute uh, in 2004 showing that patients who had lymph node involvement do a lot worse than patients who don't. This is a, a patient of mine who's, who's 25. Uh, he had a renal mass and these isolated in large lymph nodes. You can kind of see uh, the, right along the uh, aorta there. Uh, and he had had uh, the patient weighed, I think, 510 pounds. Uh, has had multiple abdominal surgeries uh, for congenital abnormalities uh, as a child. Uh, this is his uh, pathology after surgery. We did a, a, a full lymph node dissection. Uh, grade three renal cell cancer, metastatic cancer involving one lymph node. This is him three years later uh, with no evidence of disease. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and again, this is, this is somebody we all, anyone that operates on patients with kidney cancer has patients like this. So the arguments for, for performing a lymph node dissection in high-risk non-metastatic patients, potential improvement in survival, but there's also some non-metastatic patients that are cured with surgery. You'll see that it's a low rate, but it is some. So we really have to acknowledge that most of these studies are retrospective, small numbers of patients. There's definitely a selection bias in patients undergoing lymph node dissection. Uh, and there's really a lack of a standardized surgery used by different surgeons. So this kind of skips to the, uh, the chase. Do patients benefit from lymph node dissection? We know that most patients with small organ confined tumors, there is randomized data for this, probably don't benefit because they rarely have lymph node metastasis. Maybe some patients with uh, metastatic tumors benefit, but there's less data for that. There's definitely some data showing that patients without metastatic disease who have isolated lymph node metastasis would benefit. We know that locally advanced uh, patients have the highest risk of recurrence, uh, and this may be the best chance to surgically interrupt an advanced disease process. We also know that metastatic spread throughout lymph nodes is not something that's, that we can predict easily. Uh, about half of patients with uh, metastatic cancer never have lymph node metastasis. So this is the only randomized trial. Again, that's 772 patients. Uh, about 70% of these patients had T1 or T2 tumors. So these are not uh, high-risk patients to begin with. And only about 3% of these patients had metastatic disease. So it's hard to really conclude anything from this study other than that there was no uh, difference in rate of complications between groups and uh, lower-risk uh, tumors probably don't benefit from no, no dissection. So can we identify patients before surgery uh, who might have lymph node metastasis? This is a study by Dr. Blute. Uh, he he uh, looked at these five high-risk characteristics and found that they were predictive. Uh, this is a study following up on that. Uh, in patients who had two of those five high-risk characteristics, about 40% of those patients had pathologic lymph node metastasis. And only about a third of those were seen on preoperative imaging. This is another study which, again, confirms those five criteria. So which lymph nodes need to be removed for kidney cancer? Uh, it's difficult because most lymphatics flow uh, with, arteri with the arteries, uh, but it's very variable. Also, there's a lot of neovascularity, a lot of new blood vessels that are built around these tumors uh, that can alter the drainage patterns. And the lymphatic drainage of the perinephric fat is not the exact same as the kidney. Uh, there's also some direct connections uh, to the chest. So really, there's no consensus on the extent. There's no standard uh, dissection. We know that just removing the, uh, the lymph nodes around the kidney is not adequate. Uh, about 45% of patients with lymph node metastasis did not have metastasis just in that, in the hilar region right around the kidney. So this is a, a map of some of the lymphatic uh, metastasis in this study. Again, you can see it's, it's pretty variable for left and for right-sided tumors. 
This is a proposed extended lymph node dissection uh, that I think many of us still use for the right-sided tumor uh, as well as for a left-sided tumor. So moving on to some of the contemporary data for, for lymph node dissection. Excuse me. Dr. Gershman uh, is, is at Rhode Island, but uh, when he was a fellow at the Mayo Clinic, uh, he used some very fancy analysis to look at some of the more retrospective data. And using propensity score matching, didn't find a difference in outcomes for patients who got a lymph node dissection versus patients who uh, uh, just got a radical nephrectomy for renal cell cancer. This is another uh, study uh, from the same group, uh, but again, looking at patients who had 138 patients with just lymph node metastasis, so patients with no other cancer in their body. And of those patients, 16% were had no cancer in their body at five years. This is very similar to other reports, uh, Scott Delacroix in Journal of Urology, 2011. Uh, and even more important, 15% of those patients at 10 years had no uh, other cancer in their body. So about one, you have to do about six or seven lymph node dissections to get one patient like this that's free of cancer at 10 years, but it definitely does seem to uh, make a difference. So this is a, a systematic review and a meta-analysis, kind of trying to compile all the data. Uh, again, lymph node involvement is associated with the worst prognosis. There's minimal data to support a therapeutic benefit uh, in patients who, who have any type of renal cell cancer, but this high-risk group of patients uh, may warrant further study because a subset of these patients do have long-term survival after only surgical resection, which I think is important. So the take-home points. Again, poor prognosis for lymph node metastasis, but this small proportion of patients have a durable disease-free survival and we can't really predict who that is prior to surgery. So the last few minutes I'll talk about uh, direct invasion of renal cell cancer into surrounding organs. So these are both patients I saw in the last month. Uh, the, this patient in their left kidney has direct invasion into their pancreas uh, and into the splenic hilum. Uh, there was, uh, this is something that uh, surgically is a feasible resection as far as we could remove this, remove part of the pancreas and the, and the spleen and get negative margins. This patient has no other cancer in their body uh, and so uh, did well uh, and is recovering after surgery. This is uh, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. This is a, a lady who had a tumor in her right kidney and you can see it involves a significant proportion of the liver. When we mapped out the amount of liver that would have to be resected, it was really not feasible uh, from our uh, liver surgeon's uh, standpoint to remove that much of the liver at the same time. Uh, so this, this lady has been referred to our medical oncologist and is undergoing uh, pre-surgical targeted therapy. We know that this is probably the most rare of the things we're talking uh, about today. Only 5% of patients. Metastatic disease is very common in these patients and these patients rarely do well if they have adjacent organ involvement and metastatic disease. We know that in general, renal cell cancer is more likely to compress uh, other structures rather than invade them, so this is something that's rare. It's associated with a poor prognosis, a five-year survival of somewhere between five and 18%, but complete surgical excision uh, is really the only chance for cure in these patients. We know that a negative, getting negative margins in these patients is very important. So the, the most uh, common organs at risk are the adrenal gland, the uh, posterior abdominal wall, uh, the muscles, including the diaphragm that surround the kidney, the liver, the spleen, uh, the duodenum, uh, the pancreas, uh, and sometimes the colon. This is a study in 2009, and really there's not a lot uh, more recent data, uh, but showing that the liver was the most common organ in the series uh, affected. Uh, about 37% of the patients had positive surgical margins, so it's very difficult to, and you know, the surgeons are trying to spare the other structures in there, but if you can't spare the other structures, this is really where I think uh, neoadjuvant therapy has, has a role. Uh, surgical margin status was the only significant factor for recurrence and death, uh, and patients who had metastatic disease uh, did very poorly with a median survival of only around six months. So can we predict invasion preoperatively? Uh, Vitaly Margulis uh, looked at patients who had clinical invasion of other structures. Uh, and of those 30 patients, 
60% of them did not have pathologic involvement. So it was difficult uh, to predict prior to surgery whether or not the adjacent structures were invaded. Now on the two patients we showed, uh, the, the one with the liver is kind of not in doubt, but the, the patient with the pancreas involvement, uh, even if they did have more uh, uh, significant involvement, we could have removed a, a significantly larger portion of the pancreas. So kind of to, uh, to summarize, kidney cancer compresses more often than it invades. Uh, there's a poor prognosis with invasion of adjacent organs. Majority of patients with T4 disease also have metastatic disease. Surgical resection really offers the only chance for cure. There's really studies lacking uh, for patients with this type of tumor. Uh, neoadjuvant therapy may decrease the complexity of surgery in some patients. Okay, so this is, this is my final slide. This is some, uh, some new data uh, <clears throat> from the uh, Fox Chase group. And they looked at the National Cancer Database, uh, patients with metastatic uh, kidney cancer, and looked at several different cohorts. And you can see on the x-axis down there, that's the volume, that's the number of kidney cancer patients you saw per year. And then the one-year survival is on the, one, on the y-axis. And you can see as you go to a more experienced center, your chance of having a uh, survival more than one year is almost doubled in some, some respects. So this really points to the fact that going to an experienced center is really key. Having a multidisciplinary um, interaction uh, and discussion of your disease. Sometimes surgery is the right choice, sometimes it's not, uh, but you really have to have the experience to know when it is and when it isn't. Oh, actually, this is my last slide. So this is a, a patient I had who uh, we removed his kidney, and I love this tattoo. It says, gone but not forgotten. <laughs> you can see that. Thank you. <laughs>